Hey everyone, it's Mr. Rose on here. Um, I wanted to give some thoughts on the new grade nine math curriculum for that Ontario launched this year. So the course is MTH1W and the reason I am uh, just wanted to talk about it is uh, I'm a math teacher and a computer science teacher. I have degrees in both and I've been teaching math and computers for 15 years now. So I have some idea on how to teach the coding aspect of it. And I think that's what's going to throw a lot of math teachers off in Ontario. If you're not used to teaching coding, you might be wondering, well, what am I going to do? What, what do I got to, you know, what software do I need? Stuff like that. And I'll try and give you an idea of how I would teach it. So when I was reading through it, the coding really is only in one section. It's under algebra. This is where the majority of it is right here. There's a tiny bit down here in characteristics of relationship, but not that much. So the big thing I saw when I was looking at coding <coughs> um, expectations specifically, it says we're going to use coding to demonstrate an understanding of algebraic concepts, including variables, parameters, equations, and inequalities. So that tells me for sure whatever coding language or whatever you're going to use, you're going to have to use variables and solve something. Okay? You can also create code by decomposing situations into computational steps in order to represent mathematical concepts in relationship and to solve problems. Um, again, that's another one It's sort of the same thing in a way because, you know, when you solve any kind of a mathematical problem, you're going to use steps to do it. And I do have ideas of how I can uh, solve both of these in terms of a lesson, okay? And the last one is read code, predict its outcome, and then alter the code to adjust the constraints, parameters, and outcomes to represent a similar or newer mathematical situation. So see uh, 2.1 and 2.3, what I would actually do to solve the both of those is I would teach the kids how to generate a table of values using code. So if you look in the rest of the uh, the curriculum expectations, there's an there's a part where it says they have to graph um, relationships like uh, linear relationships stuff like that, and it does say that it can it can be um, table of values and then it goes graphical and stuff like that. So they are going to be working with table of values. So that's what I would do. I would write a program that the kid would basically code the equation and then it would spit out the table of values okay that's how i would would solve this okay you could also use that in terms of this one right here as well okay where maybe they get the uh the program solved or the class does the same equation everybody does the same equation and they all write a program and they get it working and you know you can mark that program okay and then what you could do is you could get them maybe to do a quiz or something where they take the same code and they just rewrite the equation. So they're going to alter their code to, to fit a new equation, right? They get, you give them a different equation or a different scenario, and they're going to use that instead. Like potentially maybe you give them a quiz and said, you know, the slope is going to be 3 and the y-intercept is 5. Um, here's a piece of code. Adjust the piece of code so it would, it would make the table of values for that. Okay? So that would be how, you, how I would tackle C2.3. Um, so 2.1, like I said, that's what I would do because I, inevitably what's going to happen is you're going to have students who are going to ask you, well, what's the point of this? Why am I doing coding? That's guaranteed going to be the question everyone's going to ask. And there is an easy way to answer that question. And I can give you a personal story myself. Um, in university, I took a statistics class and this was before the days of the internet and apps and all that stuff. Um, but I remember we had these types of math questions we had to do and, the textbook that we had, it, it gave us all of the even answers, but none of the odd answers. And we had an assignment that was all based off the odd questions. So nobody knew the answers to these, these questions. There they was an assignment, right? And the problem with these questions is that they were massive. They took literally a, a full scap of paper to solve. They were, it might have been, it wasn't standard deviation, but it was something like that. It was something that took really, really long time to solve. And it had a lot of different spots where you could make errors along the way. And if you ask 10 different people in class, what did you get for this answer? You would get 10 different answers because everybody would make a mistake somewhere along the lines and get a different answer at the end, okay? So what I decided to do was I wrote a program in Java because I was teaching, I was learning computer science at the time. I wrote a program in Java that I knew for a fact would give me the correct answer as long as I punched in the, the, the input variables correctly, okay? And so that's what I did. So I punched all of my stuff in. I knew exactly what the answer was going to be. And then when I did my actual work, I was able to check it with my computer program that I wrote. Okay, nobody else had access to that program. I mean, nobody asked me for it, but that's the power of what you can do with coding. That's just a simple example. 
So again, if a kid ever asks you, what's the point of this? This is kind of dumb. You can just tell them, you know, this we're going to teach you how to write a program where you can check your answers really easily. And you can use it in any situation. And you can use it for more complicated equations as you go later in life. And we're going to do simple ones this year, but it can get very, very compl complex later on. Um, so again, that's how I would answer that question. And you can use my story if you want to. Okay, so the big thing now is we know what I would do. Again, I'm going to do a table of values. And I'm going to do an, another video to actually show you how to do that, okay? But uh, the question now is what language um, are you going to use? The thing is, if you start looking up coding languages, there are a lot. And many of you might not be familiar with a lot of different languages. And again, you don't even know where these kids are coming from. Some kids in grade 7 and grade 8 maybe have gotten experience in some languages. There's a good chance that they know Scratch. It's, it's highly likely they've seen this before. Okay, Scratch is a type of coding. Um, it's sort of like drag and drop. Um, I don't know if I can go in right now. It looks kind of like this. It's really, really good. I would say it's great for like uh, grade seven, grade eight, or even in elementary. Um, not so sure how great it would be in high school though. Um, just because it, it, it's coding, but it's, like I said, it's got some limitations to it in a way. It's not like real coding. It's kind of like, it's a teaser to it. And I mean, I know some people disagree and say it's not real coding. Um, I mean, it's really good, but it's not what I would use in high school. Let's put it that way, okay? So if we're not going to use Scratch, what are we going to use? Okay, again, we need to be able to do equations and, and variables and stuff like that, right? Got a lot of options. You got C, C++, Java, Swift, okay? The problem with a lot of those languages is that you need to install software for them, okay? That is a problem in today's environment, okay? I, I know myself at my school, there is a lack of computer resources, so how are we going to do this? So you want to do something online, right? Okay, so what I would do is use a site called REPL, R-E-P-L. And it used to be called REPL.IT, but I think the domain has changed. Yeah, so it's called REPL.IT. Okay, this is the site that I would use. So it's an online um, uh, coding environment, okay? And it has tons of different languages built into it, okay? This is, again, I, I like REPL, but it's not the best way of coding. If it's something like for, for math and you're just going to do a couple lessons in it, this is going to be fine. If you're doing an entire course in it, I wouldn't necessarily use this. I mean, that's just my opinion. Um, but again, the reason I would not use it is because when I use something like NetBeans, it's got other features built in. It's going to run a lot faster. It's got better debugging tools, in my opinion at least than REPL has. Um, so if you're going to do more sophisticated coding, I don't know if this is the best way of doing it, but it's good for like an introduction or, or if you're in a situation where you only have Chromebooks, for example, then you need this, right? Um, so that's what's nice about it. Now, when you go in, um, I don't know if I can, I've already signed up before. Let me see if I can sign up with my uh, regular Gmail account. Let's try that. Oh, I have used it before. Okay. Um, basically, when you when you start with uh, REPL, okay, what you want to do is you can use... One sec here. Let's go back. You can sign up with anything you want. You can sign up with Google if you want, <clears throat> with Facebook. So a lot of schools are using Google accounts, and that makes life really easy, right? You could just log in with a Google account. Or you can go ahead and create one. It's free completely. And... Uh, like I said, there's other things that teachers can use as well. Let's try my school account here. Yeah. Okay. So that's, a, that's how I'm going to get in. I'm going to go in using my Google account. But you can go ahead and make your own, and, and the kids can make their own too. And it's really, really straightforward. It's not difficult to, uh, to make an account. Now, when you first come into this, it might ask you what languages you want. Okay. I would highly recommend you pick Java. The stuff I'm going to show you is going to use Java. There are other languages, though. Um, you can use any of these languages if you're comfortable with them. So C, C++, uh, Go, Rust. Kotlin is a big one now. It's getting bigger and bigger. I'm sure Python's in here. Yeah, Python, Swift. So there's a ton of different languages. Whatever you're most comfortable with, you know, just make sure the students have that in there. And if they don't, they can just add it in anyways. Okay? So this is the, the environment that I would use. 
and uh, I'll just show you how to create your first hello world and then I'll do a separate video showing you how to use variables and how I would do a table of values and stuff like that. So if I was doing this one, I'm going to create a new new REPL. I'm going to use Java and I'll just call this uh, hello world demo. Oops, demo. And let's go right now. It's going to be uh, public because I'm not paying for it. Okay. And honestly, I don't really care. It's not that really secret anyways. And you'll see it takes a little bit just to get going here. There we are. Okay, so this is it right here. This is where you put your code. And again, you're not gonna, I don't expect anyone to learn all of Java, but you know, you're just gonna know a few things just to at least get the table of values going, okay? So right here, it says class main. You're just gonna leave that, okay? And where it says public static void main, right there, you're gonna leave that as well. Your main is what all of your code runs inside of. So it starts right here at this curly bracket, it ends at this curly bracket. <clears throat> Everything in the middle is what's going to run. That's what's gonna execute. Because it always runs the main function, and that's that's the way Java works. Okay. So right now there's only one line of code, and it's this one right here. And that line of code, what it says is system.out.println, hello world. Okay, if we run it, it's literally gonna print hello world over here. So let's try it. And take a second to run. Even though they have some pretty high-powered servers, you know, it's it's a bit slow. This is what I was saying. You know, if you have an offline uh, program like NetBeans, for example, that might be a lot better situation. But REPL is fine. So it's this hello world. And the kids can, you know, if you want to change this up, you know, change what it says, right? It'll still run the same way. So the kids will have fun. I would encourage them to have some fun when they do this. You know, you don't want to really make this too boring. You want to at least make it interesting for them. And there it goes, okay? The, when you do other prints, like say you have to do another print, and you write system.out.println, my name is Mr. Roson. Make sure you put a semicolon at the end, that's gonna be a problem, the kids are gonna forget that, okay? And why is it not liking that? That's odd. Yeah, it's telling me there's errors, but there isn't. There isn't. I think it might be just compiling or something. Like it, it runs a bit slow. So this is the uh, the downside to REPL in my mind is the slowness. If it ran instantly, I would never complain about it. But it's a bit slow right now. And there it goes. Okay. So these are your print statements. Your typical print statement is going to look exactly like this. So all you would do is literally just change what's in the quotes. They have to have quotes. If the quotes are not there, it's going to it's going to fail. You got to have the brackets. Got to have the semicolon. You just basically change what's inside of here. There is another print statement that sometimes people will use, and that's print instead of print ln. Okay. And if you use print instead of print ln, that's an L by the way. Print ln. I'll show you what it does. Let's run it again. So there's two different kinds of print statements. So you can see it all went on one line. Okay. What happens is with print ln, it's almost like it puts an invisible enter at the end of the line. Okay. So when I wrote hi there and I just used the word print, what happens is the cursor basically stays right at the end of the exclamation mark. And then it starts printing whatever the next thing is. So it just says, my name is Mr. Rose on all one line. So print ln, put an L N at the end of that. What it'll do is it'll basically put a carriage return or an enter at the very end of the line. And that's something you'd want to show your students for sure. Okay. So that's it for this video. Again, I just want to give you some thoughts. Again, I'm going to do another video coming up. I'm going to show you how to do a table of values using REPL. And uh, what I would do is, like I said, get the kids signed up one day get them ready to go, get them to run Hello World, make sure they can at least run it, and that's going to be the, the biggest thing. If they can run it, then they can do the other things uh, that I'm going to show you afterwards. Okay? So hopefully this clears up some things of how I would tackle it. Again, it's up to you, but this is what I would do to deal with the uh, grade 9 math curriculum.